Well, good morning, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to Meridian Seventh Day Adventist Church, where I love the scripture that says, I was glad when they said, let us go to the house of the Lord, because it is a joy to be here and to be here with you. And <clears throat> I would like to show you a little video that um, I think pictures my Christian struggle to remain dead to self and alive in Christ. And Deanna has that booted up. I see hilarious dwarf mongoose plays dead for a hornbill. Okay, here we have it. These little mongoose, just adorable, aren't they? And then on the scene shows up the hornbill. And you see the mongoose runs to the hornbill. Oh dear God, there's a issue. Oh no, I'm dead. I'm supposed to be dead in Christ. No, let me have a go at this problem. Oh, let me, oh no, I'm dead in Christ. I'm dead in Christ, here I am. Okay, thank you God. Oh, let me, oh please God, let me. Oh, no, dead. Oh, let me take care of it. Please God, let me do something. I, I can fix this situation. Oh, I'm dead in Christ. Hold on, here it comes. <laughs> God, are you sure I can't do something? Please, Father, dead, alive, dead, alive. <laughs> oh, good Lord, I got it. <laughs> and that's my disclaimer, that I am like the mongoose. I, I remember that I'm dead in Christ, and then self-resurrects me. I get indignant or annoyed or irritated, and then I have to just send a zinger, you know, to somebody who's annoying me or hurt me. So I don't claim, and just studying this week, I thought, you know, crucibles, okay. I've been through crucibles, Lord. I, I'm getting the hang of this. I'm getting the hang of, you know, being nice to people who are mean to me <laughs> and dealing with issues. Don't you know, all week I struggled with my irritation and anger, all week, over silly things that annoyed and bothered me. And last night I confessed to the Lord, I don't have it at all. <laughs> I think, just the time I think that I've got a handle on this life situation and wrestling and struggling, God shows me that I don't. Let's bow our heads for prayer and we'll get into our scriptures. Thank you, Father God that you are loving and that you are patient, that you never leave us or forsake us, and that through your Holy Spirit we can grow through the crucibles, through the hard times, the trials. And we praise you that you will bring us your joy, and your joy is what we want, Lord. When our joy is in you, we will be the radiant, loving Christians that you intend us to be. So fill us with your spirit now and guide our minds and hearts is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So something else I found out about the mongoose as I was uh, trying to find that video is that the mongoose and the hornbill actually have a beautiful relationship in nature. The mongoose, they forage through the, like if they're on an ant hill, you know those big ant hills that you see huge ant hills, and the mongoose will go and kind of destroy and then forage for the ants to eat them, and the hornbill is there with them, eating what they leave behind, the ants that are stragglers or whatever. And in the mornings, like if the mongoose are still sleeping, the hornbill will go and call them to wake them up. And also the hornbill will call when there's a predator. So they share um, predators and prey. So they eat the same things and they're also destroyed by the same enemy. And so even though this video showed the little mongoose <laughs> interacting with the hornbill in a, an interesting way, they have a beautiful relationship that allows them to be fed and protected. And I thought, what a beautiful situation that God wants us to see there in our church, where he wants us to be fed and protected together from the common enemy, Lucifer, Satan, who destroys our peace, and many times he's the cause of our crucibles or trials. So what a beautiful relationship. I love the hornbill and mongoose now, and I'd love to have them as pets in heaven, <laughs> where I don't think they're going to be eating ants. 
So a beautiful thought, the spirit of truth in John 16. And um, I think that your, we're not going to look at this text quite yet, but the um, pastor, Michael, that just moved on, why can't I think of their last name? Pearson. He had a study on the Holy Spirit. And when we would go to Camp Ida Haven for the pastor's retreats, I would love to sit at Michael's table and get him started on the Holy Spirit. And he shared so beautifully about the work of the Holy Spirit. Well, in John 16, it talks about the spirit of truth. It says, number one, that the spirit will guide us into all truth. Number two, it will tell us things to come. And three, it will glorify Jesus. And four, it will not say anything on its own, but it will say what the Father is giving it to say. And as I read that, I said, oh, thank you, God, that's so beautiful. But wait a minute, it's not so beautiful. If the Holy Spirit leads me into all truth, he's going to lead me to see how dark my heart is and how sinful. I mean, you can look at me and say, oh, Marilyn's sweet and nice. But God is, the Holy Spirit is showing me where I need healing, where I need change. So the spirit of truth sometimes isn't quite as lovely, warm, cozy feeling. Because he's going to lead you to see the picture of where he wants you to be. And then he's going to very gently show you where you are. And sometimes you're not close to where he wants you to be. So he'll guide you into all truth. He will tell you things to come. And I like that because... When we're dealing in surgery with children and we're trying to keep them calm, we will explain to them what we're going to do and what we need them to do. And a lot of times, even my adults, I'm going to tell them, and one lady sent me a thank you note. She said, you told me exactly what to expect, and you were so reassuring and calm, and she thanked me for that. Because when we're going into the future like we are right now, people who don't know the Lord and don't know prophecy they're scared to death. I've had people come to me and say, what's happening, Marilyn? You know the Bible. Is this biblical? Is this being fulfilled from the Bible? So telling you things to come, it's not to scare you that God says there's going to be a hard time. It's to prepare you to know that he already knows that there's going to be a hard time and that you can trust him. And sometimes he tells us good things to come um, that are exciting and happy. Don't you think heaven and the picture that's painted there is very exciting? I do. I can't wait to be with my dad and my mom and people that have passed on into the sleep of death. And then three, glorify Jesus. What do you want your life to be? Do you not want your life to be a glory to God? What's our highest calling? To honor and glorify God. Because Does God need that glory and that honor? No. But we need to give God that glory and honor in order to be in a state of health, happiness, well-being. Because when we're not giving God glory, um, C.S. Lewis said something about the proud, proud man is always looking down and comparing himself, how good I am, and he can never see who is above him. Because he's const- the proud person is constantly comparing with, with others and demeaning others because they're not as good as he is. But they, they don't ever look up because they're so busy looking down. So um, I like to imagine that and pray, God, don't let people see me. Let them see you. Not for my honor, but for your honor. Because when others are honoring Christ, they also are growing and living for him. So last night I thought to myself, it's amazing. The very work that the Holy Spirit has promised to do is the very work that Jesus Christ himself did. He came to guide us into all truth, tell us who the Father really is, to tell us things to come. Did Jesus do that? To glorify the Father, did Jesus do that? And did he ever speak on his own without his father telling him what to say? No. Amazing. The work that the Holy Spirit is doing in this earth now is the very work that Jesus did when he was here on this earth. Now guess what? Make this next step. 
This is the work that you are called to do. Guide others into all truth. Tell them of things to come. Glorify the Father, but never speak on your own. Only speak what God gives you to speak. Last night when I realized that this had application, the Holy Spirit, Jesus, and me. Three in one. <laughs> and all of a sudden it was a beautiful thought that the work that the Holy Spirit does is also the work that God is calling me to do. To guide into all truth, tell people the things to come, glorify Jesus, and never to speak on my own. Always to speak what God is giving me. But I also remind myself sometimes, and my sister and I laugh about this, we're talking about situations where we're sure, like the little mongoose, he's sure he could take care of that hornbill, but he's supposed to be dead. But if, oh, just let us get to that. Well, we talk about that. We talk about issues among, at work and, and church and things, and we'll say, you know, I know I could just fix that person if I could talk to him and set him straight. And then my sister will say, yeah, but I didn't see a help wanted ad in the Holy Spirit department. <laughs> so uh, don't think you are the Holy Spirit just because your job description is similar to, or the same as the Holy Spirit. And I do, I do love to laugh. My sister and I laugh um, because I was talking about someone that had annoyed me. I had set up the situation so everything would be perfect. And then they had come and messed up the situation and done, destroyed what I had set up. And the very thing I was trying to avoid happened. So, and I don't want to go into detail because every time you rehearse an irritation or an annoyance, it replays it. You get all those bad hormones in your body from being angry again. But um, just when I thought I ever had everything under control and just right, then it all fell apart. What was my and I fail. You know, I see again the truth that I can't control things. I'm not the Holy Spirit. So there was a point I was going to make, and it escaped me, but I will get back to it. Yeah. Uh, Okay, Pastor Mike. Okay. All right. This reminds me of people who, uh, there are people, and I don't know how many or what percentage of the population of humanity, but some of us are able to control things. We have the ability to do that. We have, some of us have the time, I'm not speaking of myself, but I know people who we're very talented, very gifted, and it's easy to say, Lord, I really don't need you, although you have given me the gifts and talents to do what needs to be done, so I'm just going to do them. And so they don't ask for the Holy Spirit's help and the empowerment of God because they feel, Christ Christians now, some Christians feel that because God has given them the talents and the gifts, that they can use them at will and do not need the, the power of the Holy Spirit, current power of the Holy Spirit to work through them because they feel like, again, God has given them the talents and the gifts, so God expects me to do them and use them, and I'm happy to do it. Thank you very much. Then there are others who are unable to control things, and they feel, okay, yeah, I really need the Holy Spirit. So it's a tricky two-way street. Yeah. And that's true. And a little bit later, we're going to talk about Samson. And that's a beautiful illustration of what you were just saying. Let's go to our scripture right now. Colossians 1, 28 and 29. Somebody that has a mic, can, we re can you read that for me? Monica? <laughs> it's is this on? on? Is this yeah. on? Yeah. Oh. He is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone, pre present everyone fully mature in Christ. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. That's right. Thank you. And that, uh, 
in another version, it says struggle with all energy. And that's what our Sabbath school lesson is. And when it says, I, to this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. Okay, number one, Paul is saying that we are the ones to proclaim to everyone in this world, world that we come in contact with. We're to proclaim the salvation and to present them fully mature in Christ, which means that they have entered into the salvation relationship with God. And he says, to this end, I strenuous, strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. Now, this is a key because in this lesson, some of the struggling with all energy, the human, divine human connection, the disciplined will, radical commitment, the need to persevere, all these things are titles of our lesson and all these things we can get wrong. Because when we read, I strenuously contend or I struggle with all energy, we start thinking of ourselves. How hard do I have to struggle to win someone for the Lord? How hard do I have to struggle to overcome my anger? How much energy do I need to invest in being the Christian and walking the Christian life? And what am I struggling to do? And I would like to point out <clears throat> to you that this struggle is to be in relationship with Jesus Christ. The struggle is not necessarily <clears throat> the struggle to be good, but the struggle is found in relationship. Now, I... I talk with my coworkers at work, and there's one guy that is constantly coming to work and explaining how he was right and his wife was wrong. And I keep saying to him, you can't be doing that if you expect to remain in, this love, in a loving relationship. So what I'm trying to say to him is that his focus not, should not be on making his wife understand why he's right, but his focus should be on relationship and in the same way, in our Christian journey, prayer, Bible study, um, outreach, those are things that we need to invest energy in. It's not easy sometimes to get up before you go to work and have Bible study, because I leave for work at 6 a.m. And then other times, it's not easy when I'm strong-willed and I know I can control a situation, it's hard for me to go to God and say, God, take charge. And whatever comes of this is your will. Because I'm a hard worker and type A personality, so I get in there. If there's something to be done, I'm going to get in there and get it done right. Because everything I do, I do right. And I have a reason for everything I do. Now, that's an obsessive compulsive person, type A. So now you know more than I want you to know about me. <laughs> but Pastor Mike was talking about the strong person who can get in there and do it. So I don't want you to be confused by the divine human connection. And a lot of people will tell you, you've got to do all you can, and Christ will make up the difference. Red light. Red light. There is nothing, the Bible says very plainly, without me... You can do nothing. But then there's the other scripture that says, with God, all things are possible. So the struggle, the perseverance, is to be in relationship with God in such a way that um, we are completely under his control. Chris has a comment. I have a great example for you. I, Ron and I go to the senior center nearly every day for lunch and for friendship. Uh, and I was sitting around watching, and one particular day there was nobody doing some certain tasks. And I had asked, uh, said, I'm a volunteer. So you, need, you need me? Nobody said anything to me. So I took it to prayer by myself. I left the room, went to the bathroom, and I prayed about it. I don't want to step on anybody's toes, Lord. Heaven forbid, around here, because <laughs> uh, I've been uh, had that before. Anyway, I went back and I felt that He was 
I want you to do this. I, I want you to go get one of those carts and go to all the tables and pick up their water and their coffee and, and uh, the little hot pots and stuff and, and take them back to the, where they need to be cleaned. I said, but Lord, I didn't ask. He says, I want you to do this. That's the way I felt he was talking to me. So I did it. I just got up and went and did it. At the end, all of the other volunteers were coming back and thanking me. We can't believe you just got up and did that. And I told him why. Oh, amen. Well, I decided, and I didn't know at the time that I decided that if something needs to be done, all I got to do, and I forgot the important part, was go ahead and do it. Not talk to God and then with his leading, do it. I, so I tried that on something else, and it went over very badly. <laughs> and I got into a lot of trouble over it. So it is important to talk to him every time you want to do something, whether it's a volunteer or whatever, you need to talk to him, and maybe that's not your territory. Maybe you would offend somebody. Here, all I would get every single day is, oh, Chris is here. Hi. Yeah. But in another situation, I didn't get that. I'm, now I'm in trouble with somebody. So. so, And that's a crucible. We need to identify the crucibles, the times where the heat is on, but God is refining and, and taking us into a deeper relationship with him. I would like to go on to um, our next scripture. Would somebody be willing to read? Your wife. <laughs> and we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Amen. And this is a scripture that is taken, the saying, by beholding, we become changed. By beholding, we become changed. And I love that. We're transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory. Will you be the first to know that God's transforming you into his image? You think you, I think you might be not the first to know. I think it might be more subtle that people would say to you. And it's interesting that my brother had left the Lord for many years, and I don't think he'll mind me sharing this experience. And um, he then had, God touched his heart, and God showed him God's love because he had always been a perfect Christian. He was a good a good Christian. He could follow all the rules, but he lost his way because he did not understand how much God loved him. So when he came back to the Lord, it was interesting that um, his wife was saying that their relationship had gotten a lot better. And he said, no, you just got a lot sweeter. Isn't that interesting? Because she had not lost her walk with God. He had but when he came back to the Lord, she was saying that their relationship was better. And he said, no, you've gotten sweeter. <laughs> so it's very interesting dynamic that when God is in charge of our lives, there are fewer times. Oh, I shouldn't say that after this week. <laughs> there, there may be fewer times where you can identify, okay, God's working in me because I didn't get irritated or I didn't get annoyed or or this person didn't offend me cuz offenses work both ways we can offend people they can and they can be offended because of us and that's a hard issue to work out but in all of it god wants to be united with us so um, philippians 2:13 who would like to read that right chris said maybe i had this, this kind of week to prepare me for today and i think you're absolutely right yeah, that God showed. Can somebody read this for us? Thank you. For it is in God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Amen. So work, it is God who works in you to will. Another version says, and to do. To will and to do. Now, there are times when I can think, okay, God, 
willed me to do this, so I'm going to get out there and get it done. But wait a minute. God said he works in us to will, and he should be the power that gets it done. Otherwise, we take glory to ourselves. When evangelist comes and he baptized, uh, when I was 10, we had an evangelist that came, and 30 people were baptized, and we started our church. But guess what? For 12 years, my dad had been giving Bible studies and doing a lot of work. But the evangelist could have felt like, oh, look what my preaching, look how many people came to the Lord and were saved because of my preaching. Don't forget, God's been way ahead of you all the time. So if you think that something good has come as a result of your actions, believe me, God's been planting seeds years before you were ever on the scene. So the glory that we take to ourselves um, is sometimes not healthy because it is only when we give God glory that we will be in a loving, healthy relationship with him. One last text. Someone to read it? Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. So set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed. This is NIV. King James doesn't mention that is coming. And I kind of like that version a little better because as I read it, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you or the strength, you might say, or the power or the energy to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed. So it's true at his coming. But I think when you're studying and reading the word of God and God reveals something to you, that that will motivate you. Anytime you see God's love, that motivates you. And I, I told a story of the motivation of love. When I was 16 years old, my dad had heart, had a heart attack when he was 14. And he had, um, when I was 14, sorry, he was, well, he, I was five when he had his first heart attack at 41. So at 14, he had a second heart attack. So our dairy farm, which my dad was a surgeon, but he believed that children should work, so he bought a dairy farm. And my brother said, yep, we never smoked, drank, or caroused because we were dead tired. We got up at 3.30 every morning, and by 7 o'clock, we were exhausted working the farm. They said dad knew exactly what he was doing when he bought that dairy farm. <laughs> but the um, gentleman that was leasing my dad's farm had called and said to my dad, there's a silo that has about... 10 to 15 feet of rotting silage. Now, how many of you have ever been in a silo, a capped silo with silage, corn silage? You know what it smells like? I mean, it, it's beautiful. <laughs> the aroma. <laughs> it's life to the cows, but man, it can choke you. <laughs> well, this had not only been, it wasn't even just silage now, it had been in there for long enough that it was now rotted, and the stench was terrible. This is in North Carolina, 80, 90 degree days with 90 to 100 percent humidity. And the gentleman said to my dad, you got to get that silage out of there. And it's, I priced it uh, with a, somebody that would ta take it out and it's $2,000. And, and we heard my dad saying, man, $2,000 that I have to spend. In those days, that was a lot of money. So my twin sister and I said, daddy, we'll get it out. And so we went out to the farm with bandanas over our faces, and we worked for two days, two solid days of pitching out that silage so it could be hauled away. And I'm telling you, I was sweating like, you've never sweat like that before. It's like being in a hot, moist sauna for six to eight hours in a day. And we were just dead tired. We go hop in the lake, and then go home and get a bath and go to bed. But the gentleman kept coming out. The guy that leased my dad's dairy would come out and check on us. Look, where are these teenage girls out here doing, you know? Okay, you guys all right in there? Yeah, we're all right. And then when um, we finished, Dad called him on the phone, called the man on the phone, and said, was the job satisfactory? You know, are you happy? Is everything okay? And then... 
he said yes and said something else to dad, and then dad hung up. And I could see tears welling up in my dad's eyes. And so I said, Daddy, what is it? He said, that man could not understand how two teenage daughters of a doctor would spend two days in a dirty silo like that, digging all, all that silage. And then he looked at us and tears poured even more, and he said, that man does not understand love. I loved my daddy so much that there was nothing I wouldn't do for him. And when he thought he was going to spend $2,000, my sister and I, there was no way we were going to let him spend that $2,000. And we went and spent those two days digging out that rotted silage. Now, I don't know if it ever damaged my lungs. <laughs> but for me, the picture of love, what are you willing to give for God? When you realize how much he loves you, you will not hold on to anything of this world. You will be willing to sacrifice anything that would bring him honor and would bring him glory. And I just, I can only explain that through that story as it's difficult sometimes for me to feel that I love God. But I must know that I love God because feelings cannot be trusted. It's only what you know that God... Um, about God that will take you through hard times. Now, I'd like to use uh, an illustration here of our relationship with Jesus Christ. Uh, this is a scuba diver, and you see all the gear she's got on, the vest that she wears. Um, it helps to compensate for buoyancy. You can put air into the vest, and it will help you float. But if you're trying to be on the bottom of the ocean, you don't want to be floating up, so you would dump air, and it will let you then sink down further. Um, it, it also has an emergency, um, say that you're about to be attacked by a shark or something, and you hit a button, and it skyrockets you to the surface. You don't want to hit that if you're really deep. But uh, there's also... Uh, connected to the tank. There's the gauges that tell you how much oxygen you have. There's a gauge that tells you how deep you are. There's all kinds of different, and, the, and now they have watches that track how long you've been down, at what depth you've been, and if you're coming back up, what, what levels you need to, st what depths you need to stop and decompress and stay there for five to seven minutes, whatever your watch tells you. It calib calculates that. But there's also the regulator that goes in the mouth and the mask that goes over the eyes because without the mask, you don't see underwater very clearly. And so if, it, if you ask me, there's a lot of work to getting ready to scuba dive. You gotta put on the wetsuit, you gotta put on this, you gotta put on that, you got. But once that person is down in the water, look at that. That's beautiful. All the colors that God has created. And, I believe in heaven we'll go scuba diving without gear. I think God will just take us down there and show us everything. <laughs> but um, also in diving, usually you have a buddy. It's much safer to have a buddy. I'd like you to think of this in relationship to God and to us. God said, put on the whole armor, the helmet of salvation. It goes over your brain. You know, don't be looking at movies. There's violence and lust and stuff. Protect your brain. Protect your brain from thinking thoughts that create feelings of anger. There's a lot that goes on into the shield of faith to thwart all the fiery darts of the devil. You know, God has listed the things of his armor that he wants us to put on. But <clears throat> I don't think he just says, here, put this on. I think he puts it on us. I think he dresses us. And it, it is nice when someone who knows what they're doing help you get all your gear on and help you get into the water. But <clears throat> say that I'm down at 100 feet, and I decide that I'm sick and tired of that regulator in my mouth. Because you have to bite on the rubber blocks that hold it in. And you say, I'm just so sick of this. I'm just going to spit this thing out. How long are you going to live down there? <laughs> as long as you can hold your breath <laughs> not very long but
but every piece of equipment that this scuba diver wears, it reminds me of the relationship that we need with God. He is the breath of life. He is our food. He is our nourishment, the Holy Spirit, all these things. So the relationship that the Christian life, when they say it's a struggle, it's not a struggle on your own energy. It's a struggle to trust God and distrust yourself, to be alive in God and dead to self. And the same way that you put on that scuba gear and you get to see the beauties of God's creation, when you remain in such intimate relationship with God, he will show you the beauties, even in the crucibles, even in the trials, even in the hurts and the pains, God will show you the beauty of his love. But you have to be in connection constant connection with him. Pastor Mike has a comment. Yeah, this reminds me of, of what you're saying about the scuba diving. We are just as dependent upon uh, God as we are dependent upon that regulator in the oxygen tank or the air tank. And uh, when you're scuba diving, <clears throat> you're very keenly aware of your dependency when you go under the water and you're down 60 feet in particular or even deeper, uh, that's your life right there. Amen. And, you know, we live in a world where we get through time used to things and take things for granted. But we are in a, when we're in a crucible, we become much more keenly aware of our, de our need to be dependent totally on the Lord. And we're living in a time in, the, in, in these days in which we're living of the hour of God's judgment, as Revelation 14 tells us in the three angels' messages. Um, his, his judgment hour is giving us opportunity for him to do his judging work in us and doing away with sin. And so uh, we must continually uh, try to keep ourselves aware of our desperate need, especially right now in these Amen. last days Amen. for for God, because the world can come to a, a close really quickly. Mm -hmm. The window of opportunity can close uh, very quickly before we even know it. So let's stay faithful to the Lord in, in uh, not in obedience. That's not what I want to say, but stay faithful in going to the Lord so that he can produce the, the obedience through, in through us. Amen. So I like to say to my boys when I've talked to them, I say, guys, I love you. Now be on your knees and in the word because there's only one thing that means anything to me in life, and that will mean that my children are with me in the future life, that my brothers and sisters, that my church family, I want you with me in the future life. So be in the word, be on your knees, behold Christ, be in, in Christ, and Christ is called the word, and, and the Bible is also the word, So and to be in prayer. Now, I can pray an awful lot, and sometimes I think to myself, okay, God, I'm talk, I've talked to you all day. How in the world did I get mad at Michael? <laughs> and God says, because you were talking and not listening. <laughs> So there we, we learn our lessons. Well, the lesson did point out um, three people who made choices based on their feelings. The first was Eve. She accepted praise and lost sight of God. Then there was David and Bathsheba. David was lusting. He saw her beauty and he wanted it for himself. And then he rationalized why it was all all right and it led him to murder. And then there was Peter, who was willing to eat with the Gentiles until some other Jews showed up. And all of a sudden, he couldn't eat with the Gentiles because it was beneath him. He was a Jew. So <laughs> we see so many different Bible. And I love that Hebrews says that we have such a cloud of witnesses that we can take encouragement and lessons from. But now I wanted to share just a couple thoughts about Samson. He was ordained by God. God came to his mom and said, you're going to have a son, and he's going to be a Nazarite. Don't cut his hair. Don't drink any strong drink or unclean foods while you are pregnant. And that 
is the first time the Bible mentions prenatal care. Isn't that interesting? Samson, where the mother was told not to drink alcohol and not to eat unclean meats and um, instructed on how to care for her body so that the child would be blessed and healthy. And so then Samson comes along, he's born, and they instruct him in his call that God has given him to be a judge for Israel. The Philistines had oppressed the Israelites. Every time their crops were ready, the Philistines came in and took everything. And any time they had cattle, the Philistines would come in and take their cattle. It was like constant um, oppression from the Philistines. So God raised up Samson to be able to deal with him, and he gave him extraordinary strength. And so he was able to go into battle and kill many people. But guess what? Samson chose what he wanted. It says in Judges 14, verse 3, he said to his parents, I want this heathen woman for a wife. And they said, no, no, no. Look at all these godly women. He said, no, she pleases me. And it's amazing, that very thought, she pleases me. How many times have I said, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, don't, here, stay with me, but turn your face just a minute. I need to eat this pound bag of M&Ms. <laughs> they please me, chocolate peanut M&Ms. <laughs> and I like to use sometimes food uh, chocolate because it's an easy illustration and I don't offend anybody by saying that. But what are the other choices that we say, I feel like it? <laughs> but there are other times that I get so angry and I want to tell someone off and I feel like it. Well, I do it well in the car. I say, get off the road, sweetie. <laughs> but that's not even godly, is it? No, it's not godly. So remember, your feelings can lead you into devastating results. So do you know the Sam stories of Samson then? Because he did things under his own power. It was God-given power, but he was doing them without thinking of God's glory. So he married a woman, and then they got mad about something, and he left. And they came back to get her, and she'd been married to someone else. So he tied all these foxes together and lit their tails on fire and destroyed the crops of the Philistines. And he carried their city gate. Oh, you could read in Judges, and what a phenomenal story of Samson. And then finally his own people betrayed him. And he allowed them to betray him because he said, well, tie me up and you can bring me to the Philistines. But he said, you're God's people and I'm serving, I'm working on God's side. He wasn't serving the Lord. He's working on God's side, he thought. And he said, so don't you do anything to me. So then the Philistines took him, poked out his eyes, made him grind corn. And then one night they're all having a big feast, worshiping their God Dagon, praising God for giving Samson to them. And Samson says to the Lord, Lord, one more time, let me do something for your honor one more time, and when I do this, Lord, I will die, but I'm willing to die for your glory. Then he got, uh, had the young man, now he's blind, he had the young man lead him to the big supporting pillars, and he pulls those pillars down, and he killed thousands of leading people of the Philistines, the lords and, and their ladies, and he killed more people in his death in that one act than he killed in his entire life. So he died under God by choice. The pain and suffering that he endured were brought upon by himself, but the pain and suffering were his salvation because then he could look to God. He, so um, a contrast to that would be Job. Job did not bring anything on himself, but yet he went through trials and troubles. What time do I stop? I always forget. Into, oh, we got five minutes. <laughs> so even Jesus, and, and I'm going to fly through these. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. These are Jesus' very words. So what we dish out, we get back. Cast your bread on the water, and after many days it will return to you. But then again, sometimes when I'm in a crucible and someone has shamed me, I had 
<clears throat> an anesthesiologist once yelled at me in, in the recovery room in front of nurses and patients. He was screaming, you were the worst thing that ever happened to this department. If we could, we would get rid of you tonight. And don't expect to have your job. You know, he just screamed for about 10 minutes in front of patients and nurses. I went home devastated. My boys were little. They were probably two and four. But years later, they said, Mommy, remember the night you came home crying? They remember that. <laughs> and that he shamed me so badly. But the shame that he caused, I had to say to myself, Lord, have I shamed others? I had to stop because of these things. What you give will be given. Did you ever think of it that way? I had always thought of it before. If I'm nice, if I'm kind, if I'm sweet, then goodness and niceness and sweetness will come back to me. But wait a minute, what about Job? Do you see what I'm saying? I say to myself, Marilyn, have I really been nice? Okay, I, Lord, I want you to make me nice so that I'm not shaming other people. Shame is not a healthy thing. God does not shame people. You can read stories all the time where he corrected people but never brought shame to them. But I do believe that when we are good and kind, that goodness and kindness come back to us, maybe only from our God, Father God. Did you ever think of that? Maybe we have to wait for all the goodness and all the blessings to come back on us. These are just thoughts I'm throwing out for you to ponder because um, there is so rich when I realize that relationships on this earth are so multifaceted and multi-leveled. I can never trust that I've done the right thing. I can only trust that God will bring goodness through me, his goodness through me and out to others, his love into me and out to others, and trust him with the results of it. Uh, there was a scripture that they brought out this week that said, if you gouge out your eye, you know, if your eye offends you, gouge it out. And that's hard to understand, but I have to tell you something. I went to the dentist and the dermatologist this past week. And I said, it's the medical profession that you pay them to hurt you. <laughs> so the dentist dug around in my mouth and scraped all that stuff out. And then I went to the dermatologist. And you may not be able to see it. I have a little Band-Aid up here. There was a precancerous spot that they froze with that chemical and man, does it hurt, and did it hurt when they did it. But guess what? I'm going to go back because there's another spot that they found that later we're going to get rid of too, and it's going to hurt. But that's how I want to be with God. When, I, when he shows me something that needs to be removed, I want to say, God, remove this from my life. Remove it and allow him to remove that from your life. And now I understand gouge your eye out. If, you're, if something is bad for you, don't you want God to take it away from you? Even if it's going to hurt. I have one minute. Why did Jacob think it was an enemy who touched him the night Jacob was wrestling with the angel? Did he not know God's touch? I say to myself, Marilyn, be willing to know when it is God who is touching you, even if it hurts, and let it be God that heals you. God bless you in all your crucibles. Look for the outcome. Look for God's will and seek his glory. God sees our greatest capabilities and consumes our complacency. God develops our greatest capacities through our greatest trials and difficulties. God bless you all.